It's time for Fort Worth Musical Moments. Join us now as Steve Markworth takes a look at the music and the artists who made the city's vibrant musical legacy what it is today. Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Fort Worth Musical Moments. I'm your host, Brent Adams, along with co-host Steve Markward. And Steve, it's been a busy week. How are you? Busy week. Yeah, I just got back from Tennessee, uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, to be exact. Uh, uh, day before yesterday, had a great trip there. You joined us for for uh, some of that and uh, making, you know, I, I'm just, that, that studio is just I just love being in that studio with a caliber of musicians and with the greatest producer in the world, Kurt Ryle. And I'm um, so excited about the music we're putting out. And, and when we uh, actually, you brought us a new artist that we're excited about as well. I love it. Yes. Evie May. You're going to be hearing a lot about her. Uh, uh, just a, a sophomore in high school and a musical phenom here with just a, a mature, great voice. And we'll be talking more about her and we'll share a clip of uh some of your handiwork here from this week uh toward the end of the show here so I hope well the cool thing about the cool, the cool thing about evie may is she's kind of a a, a teenage female version of ted nugent <laughs> <laughs> indeed out, she's an outdoors woman she loves to get out and shoot and, and uh, hunt and ride those four wheelers and so uh we i think that's going to be a big part of her brand you know is to, uh but uh, we're excited about that not afraid to mix it up out there and she says she would rather deal with the boys than the girls because she doesn't like the drama and we like <laughs> we we like that i i get that a thousand percent so uh it, excited to work with her and Steve's boots are back on the ground in Fort Worth, Texas here. and We're ready for another show today. And our special guest is the proprietor of the Fort Worth Memories Museum. And he has various Fort Worth themed live streams doing a great job with those. And we wanted to welcome into the program, Larry O'Neill. Larry, how you been? I am great, guys. How are y'all? We we're doing great. Uh -oh, we got some feedback here. Hang yeah, on. I'm turning it down. Okay. All right. Good. Yep. We only... One Larry O'Neill's enough, Larry. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I second that motion. So how is things in Louisville, Kentucky? I know how Steve is here in Fort Worth. It's rainy, but it's busy here. We've been uh, doing the Mid-America Trucking Show this week here after spending time in, in Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, the Mid-America Trucking Show is one of the biggest trucking shows in the country. They have another big one in uh, August in Dallas, I believe. So those are two of the biggest ones. And next to the ag industry, you know, uh, the, the trucking industry is a, another great industry. It's the industry that keeps America moving here and keeps agriculture moving. And, and so we like to support the truckers and and, and kind of tell the stories where agriculture intersects with the trucking industry. So been working on a lot, a lot of content there, uh, meeting a lot of good folks. I'll be back out there immediately after I get done uh, here today. So we'll be sharing more of that content on social media. So thank you to everybody who's been uh, liking and sharing that content, met, meeting a lot of great people and, and, and learning some fascinating insights, you know, and talking to the trucking crowd. One of the big things that they're dealing with is just uh, uh, labor problems there, you know, and not just uh, uh, people to to haul because they, they tell me there there's enough drivers. They just they're having trouble retaining them. But when you talk to people who build trailers and and some of the products for trucking and are just having a really hard time finding em employees and and you kind of look at the big picture of how all that fits together long term, there there's some issues there in that industry. So, yeah, we try to tell some of those stories and bring some of that to light and hopefully affect some change down the line. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was looking at uh, some photos in one of my libraries last night. In 1980, there was a uh, there was some kind of strike where they drove all these tractors to D.C. Do you all remember yes. that? Yes. Uh, yep. And the picture is in front of Mrs. Baird's bakery. And you know who's sitting on that lead tractor? No. Willie Nelson. Wow. OK. So they all drove these tractors to D.C. I don't know. Was it the farmers striking or? Well, all? yeah, it was a, you know, the big farm crisis where you had kind of uh, it, the inflation in the 80s and you had a lot of people losing farms. And, uh, you know, it, it was a very tumultuous time. And I know a lot of people, I know my friend David Widmar with Agricultural Economic Insights did a whole podcast series on uh, uh, surviving the 80s, escaping the 80s, kind of looking at what's going on today and how, how it, some of it parallels what was right. going on in 1980 and and that was absolutely the deal they were trying to get the attention of congress 
uh, to, to try to get some help for, for farmers because, you know, you had these at this time, second, third, maybe fourth generation farms that uh, uh, were going under and, uh, you know, not a lot was being done to, to help it. And there was a lot of owners regulations being put on farms and it was, it was basically just driving a lot of those legacy farms out of business. Yes, I remember it distinctly. So, well, you know, but part of the mission that we have here is to uh, kind of help people understand that past, understand some of those variables that went into that and uh, making sure that we don't end up there again. And, uh, you know, it's exactly. disconcerting because if you if you look at some of those factors, uh, you're starting to see history repeat itself a little bit. Yes, exactly. Well, it's, it's You'll remember that's what drove that uh, wildly successful farm aid concert. Yes. Uh, right. Thing. I think it was Willie, Neil Young, Bob Dylan, Merle Haggard. Those guys kind of all pulled together and, 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 uh, and, pull, and uh, that thing was right up there with that live aid thing. Uh, and uh, I think, you it's, know, I was part of that live aid. Were you really? Yeah, I was. I actually did business with a lot of bookmakers back then and I raised quite a bit of money. And so, as a treat, they sent the plane for me. I had to get to Houston, and then we went to the Philadelphia end of it, and that's where I met Ashford and Simpson. I met a lot of those performers uh, at that Live Aid deal. That that deal was put together in 10 weeks, and it raised like $20, $28, 29000000 million. Yeah, that was a historic concert for a lot, you know, a lot of reasons. Uh, in fact, that was kind of the focal point of that movie about Queen, that their performance there was right. Mark. When you said you were a part of it, I was going to go back and look at that video and see if I saw you next to Bob Geldof or anybody. I was, I was, uh, people that raised over a million dollars, they, they flew them up there. Wow. And I raised two million and, uh, I'm, I'm in a bunch of shots on videos, but I, I've never seen them reproduced. I mean, right. I was, I was on that stage with several of those performers, but not while the acts were going on but that was really something to see it was just total chaos for i was there for four days and i mean those people never stopped they is 24 7 getting that thing put together they had one here in, in philadelphia and then the other part was in england wembley england right yeah yeah i but, remember that. uh it was uh i was i was fortunate and valerie ashford uh or she Simpson anyway, the Ashford and Simpson, Valerie, she still sends me a Christmas card every year. Huh. Her husband is dead, but uh, when they came out with that song, uh, Solid, I sent him, a, sent him a note and said, God, I love that song. And she sent me a, a DVD of it, and it was signed by them. Wow. Larry, you've been in a lot of, a lot of uh, monumental moments, uh, you know, in, in, in and around Fort Worth and, and otherwise it sounds like. Uh, so uh, I think that's interesting. And that's, that's one of many reasons why we wanted to have you on the show. Obviously you're the reason why we're on here to begin with. Um, and so I, I, I'm appreciative as always that you uh, invited me uh, to, 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 to do this musical moment show. And, and uh, of course, adding Brent uh, as the, the host and the adult supervision, so to speak. <laughs> kind of well, round. this show, this show, I said it from the start, it's gonna, it's gonna be huge. Just takes a little bit of work. People always ask me how you get so many people. You just, you have to be dedicated, do the same thing every day and go out there. And once they see you, you're on. Right. All about creating fresh content and yes. it there and, and, you know, giving people a reason to want to come back to you time and time again. We And that's what y'all do. Y'all provide a lot of history that we so sorely need because we don't know where the music comes from. We don't know what Bob Wills or Milton Brown or any of the early day uh, artists had to go through. Uh, I don't know if I've told you, Steve, that I was reading a, uh, an old book that was printed back in the thirties or the forties. And it was talking about when Milton and Sam Cunningham with, uh, what was the name of the place? Uh, out on white settlement road Springs. Yeah. Crystal Springs. They got crossways. Of course, the way they got paid back then was they split the door and Milton and the Brownies wanted more, more of the door money. And Sam said, 
out of here. So they went. I finally found out where the Brownie Tavern was. It was on Highway 199 across the street from Casino Beach. And they didn't have electricity. They had a power generator. Can you imagine that? And they just had a string of lights and people would be dancing and then the thing had run out of fuel and they'd have to stop and they just made do. So in other words, it was, it was pretty tough. And, and in this article, they interviewed Milton and he said, somebody told me they were given free out in the parking lot was given free tickets to crystal Springs. He went out there and looked and it was Sam Cunningham. <laughs> and, but anyway, they got back together. Everybody knows the story. They got back together. They were better together than they were apart. And uh, so it's good that y'all provide current entertainment that we all love and like, and then also tell us the history. And it's good that we've got Nashville and Kentucky and different parts of the country or the, or the world. Y'all will have some people on sometime that's from another continent. Yeah. Yeah. We've got, there's, there's no shortage of potential guests that we, we have teed up eventually. And, uh, um, you know, Fort Worth is just, Fort Worth, it's got such a soul uh, as a city um, when you compare it to some other cities, you know, Fort Worth is becoming a bit, you know, it is a big city. It's a, what, what is it right now? In 12th, terms, 12th, 12th, largest, 12th city. largest city in the U S yeah. And yet there's still small, small town elements about Fort Worth, which make it, and we haven't lost the soul of the city and the heritage of the city. And that's been being, preserved by people like you, Larry, which, you know, we're all grateful for. And, and the stockyards area has been well preserved and now it's just booming. It's crazy down there, but there's so many stories. You know, we talk a lot about country music and Western swing and, and, and of course, Bob Wills and Milton Brown, what a great story that is. And, uh, you know, and we're documenting that well through shows like this and, and ultimately through my brother's documentary film, which, um, uh, it's just, you know, an amazing, uh, deal, but there's so many other stories to tell, uh, about, you know, the, the blues, you and I were talking about that, the, the blues roots of Fort Worth, the early rock and roll roots, uh, just, you know, there's so many interesting stories to tell that, that, uh, that a lot of people probably don't know. You know, there was a small venue here, Panther Hall, that brought so many of these later in life huge artists really nelson was there uh, that was before ponytail willie yeah. and uh you know uh just all of them they all played at panther hall and it was a very small venue i would say it was smaller than uh national hall wouldn't you steve or do you i i you know i i went once i think for a concert there that that was in the 70s i went to see a friend of mine's uh uh a friend of mine's mother was dating the bass player for Red Steagall. Uh, and so we went to see Red Steagall and he was performing on the same bill with, I think the Gatlins, the Larry Gatlin and them were playing. So I remember going to a show there, but I, I, I think it, it wasn't any larger than national hall. Yeah, no, it was small. It was but, a small venue and they brought, uh, they brought them all in there. I think the problem, one of the problems with that, that hall, uh, one of the contributing factors of it closing down was just the area that was in kind of got a little dicey. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And the acoustics were not very good. They, yeah. they, they needed a sound system just like national hall does. But, but that Panther hall is, you know, so many great people came through there, you know, I, I you know, and that, uh, that's, that's worthy of, of its own book. I think just to talk about, you know, all the people that came through national hall and there's so many stories like that you were talking to larry uh, you and i were on the phone earlier talking about the old bluebird lounge uh and brent pardon us we're not trying to cut you out here oh so. no I, i'm listening you're fascinated but the old bluebird lounge you know which is where all these these legendary blues people came through and it was just a little house like a frame house exactly i remember they had uh, you know, I'd go in there and first of all, you could park your car across the street. And, and if you wanted to, you know, you could park your car for free, but if you wanted your car to be one piece, when you got out, yeah, you had to pay, you might want, want to pay. Otherwise you're going to be missing some wheels, or hubcaps or whatever. Uh, and then they were smoking barbecue the night, the, the, one of the times I went through and I noticed 
I was like, wonder what they're smoking that with hickory uh, or uh, 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 mesquite. And I, and then I saw a guy tear a piece of plywood off and throw it in the fire. I thought, oh, it's plywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the few, t- well, not one of the few. I, I was in there a lot. Robert Ely was a good friend of mine. Uh, but I took a, a gal in there. That was before I was married, and I said, "There's no telling who'll be here." I hadn't looked at any playbills, and it's Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. So yeah. you didn't know who was going to be there, but it was always good entertainment. But what Steve's talking about in the part of town that you were in, there was people out there that say, "Hey, you give me five bucks, I'll watch your car," and that was a good deal. Yeah. And because it was just not in the best part of town and it's been redone and it says it's open, but I can't get any information on it. I'm going to research it. I think the joke was, give me five bucks and I'll watch your car or don't give me five bucks and I'll watch your car drive away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, so many legendary, I remember going in there and Larry, you remember the ceiling in that place was like six foot six or something. Yeah. It was it. And, and, and I remember people in there dancing and some of the taller gentlemen in there, they, they put their hand on the ceiling and, yeah. uh, uh, and, and it was just, it was just one of those clubs, you know, it was just dark and it was smoky and, but man, the music that came out of there, you know, I think BB King played there when he'd come through, he, he would come in there late night and do jam with those guys. It was one of those little juke joint things, you know? Yeah. Uh, Sam and Dave played there. I've got their playbill. Uh, Gladys Knight was there, uh, Sister Sledge. Wow. I mean, there was all kinds of music in there. And to the best of my knowledge, I think Robert Ely owned it. Yeah, I think you're right. Is Robert Ely still alive? Oh, no, 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 no. I was at his funeral. Uh, but, uh, no, he was not, uh, he's not alive, but he was a good guy. Wes Williams is a good friend or was a good friend with him. Robert, I detailed his old, he had no uh, uh, Undertaker's limousine. And I used to detail that thing. And I, I, I talked to him one time and he said, I'm kind of short on money. I said, you've been short on money every time I've done your car. I never charged you <laughs> not a penny. But he was just a, such a, a, a great guy. And he never had any money. So I guess he didn't charge enough or whatever. He didn't manage his money right. But uh yeah. No, Robert was a good guy. Yeah. So, Larry, I, I'm fascinated by just your grip on the history of Fort Worth. Where did all that come from? And uh, if you could just tell us a bit about uh, the creation of the Fort Worth Memories Museum. How did all that come about? It started about uh, about 40 years ago. I got interested in, uh, well, I've always been interested in history. And uh, I met a a gentleman that was the attorney for two different families. One of them was Eamon Carter. The other one was the Lipschitz family. And the Lipschitz owned Zales Jewelers and West Texas Produce. And so when they would have their meetings and would call Mr. Herman over, he would, the patriarch of the family, Mrs. Lipschitz, would have the meeting with the family. And then Mr. Lipschitz would sit outside my mother's house was next door to it up in Park Hill. And as a younger guy, I was, uh, I'd talk to him and he gave me some uh, deeds from back in the late 1800s. And, you know, I said, well, this is kind of neat. So I started going down to the library. And once you get that bug, it never leaves you. And so then uh, about 30 years ago, I started in earnest and I spent over $4 million collecting stuff. Wow. I've got over 89,000 pieces in this museum. There's 6,400 pieces. So I've got uh, most of it all is one of a kind stuff that you can't duplicate. You've got, you've got like uh, one of the things that I, you know, I just love uh, and I miss the old bookstores. So, you know, I, I was telling uh, Kirk Ryle up in Tennessee, we were, we were, had to run into bed, bath and beyond to get some stuff for, for the, for, for Jill and, and uh, our friend Jenny that was with us. And I said, I don't, I'm not a shopper. I, I'm one of those that would like to go in and get what I want and get out of there. But one of the places, one of the, unless you're talking about a music store 
or or a bookstore. And of course, there's not too many bookstores left anymore. But I I would love I used to love to go in bookstores. I could get lost in there. And and you've got so many books. One of the things that's intriguing to me, especially being a Fort Worth native, is all the old high school annuals that you've got in there. I've got over fifteen hundred. And, and so here's a new deal that I've started. Uh, if you went to Northside High School uh, in the 1940s or 50s or whatever, come by and I should have your annual and sign it and date it now. And the way I got started on that, a World War II veteran, Fisk Hanley, came by a couple of years ago and he was 100. And he was telling me about when he was at Carswell and he was a prisoner of war in the Japanese uh, concentration camp. And so I found his 1938 annual and he signed it. Wow. And I thought, cause when I leave, when we're all no longer here, this museum and forward musical moments will keep going. I mean, somebody else will pick up our slack. And so I'm trying to get people now before they pass on to come by and sign your annual. Yeah. And then just keep adding to that. That's how you add. That's how you keep these collections going. Yeah. It runs the gamut. You got annuals. I know I, I, I saw you got some sports memorabilia there. Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got something of ever, everything. There's no facet of Fort Worth or Tarrant County that I don't have uh, the real deal. So your, your roots run pretty deep in Fort Worth, Larry. And yeah, you want to tell a little bit of the story. I mean, it, whatever you you want to talk about on that, but I know, that's a pretty colorful story going back to, to you know, your family. and. Well, my aunt was the first female serial killer in Texas. Okay. Her name was Ada Scarborough Bilbury. You can look her up. Uh, on my dad's side, they, it's all been gangster life since my great-grandfather. So, yeah, we got a colorful history in Fort Worth. Uh, when, I do, when I do public speaking, one of the deals I do is uh, I own a company called Gangsters in Cowtown, and uh, it draws 100, 150 people when I go to Old South or one of these restaurants. And invariably, there'll be 50 or 60 ex-policemen there that they'll come up after it's over and say, I used to I used to handle when they needed your dad. When they called in the usual suspects, I'd go get Blackie. That's what they call my dad. And so I've learned a lot from them just from them knowing him. I've got this book I was showing Brent earlier. You know this book, Larry. Yes. Her, right. Ann Arnold is going to give me all of her research material when she passes. She told me one time, uh, I would have put your dad in there, but he was too gruesome. He'd be eating pizza and cutting up bodies. Wow. So, yeah, it was. The Larry, we're awfully glad you kind of broke that that chain and uh and decided to go to a more uh civilized life <laughs> well you know uh, you know uh steve in 1984 i was still in it then i got shot by one of my own guys six times in the back uh i spent a good portion of 84 and 85 in the hospital learning how to rewalk and you know i blacked that part of my life out and uh i guess it was late 90s I was heading home and I, and it flashed. I saw who shot me and I knew he had a TV repair, VCR repair shop in uh, River Oaks. And I called home and told my wife, I said, I, I might not be coming home. And I had my hand on my gun. And when I, my hand opened that door to his business, something just kind of went over me and he had a customer and he got rid of the customer and he said, I guess you figured it out. And I said, yeah. And he was kind of scared. And I said, I just want to shake your hand. And he said, shake my hand. And I said, yeah. I said, you saved my life. Because the way I was going, I wouldn't live to see the 90s. Wow. So, you know, everything happens for a reason, they say. So ever since then, this year on my bicycle drive will be the 37th year I've given away bikes to people here, kids here in Fort Worth. You know, uh, there's, uh, I can, I can see uh, in my life as well, and I, I see how, uh, and, and I'll just be bold him and say that that God, if you let him, he'll take every liability and turn it into an asset. You know? Oh yeah, no, that's, you're right. That's exactly what you're happened. Right. 
that was a turning point in your life and, and what an incredible story. And yeah, I know how much you do for the community. Um, and the, you know, just, just having that, that museum is not, a, there's no profit motive there. It's a labor of love. I know. See that. So. Yeah. So, you know, we're all here for a purpose and we all, for the people that try to, I, I really have an open heart for teachers and people that try to teach our youth uh, the correct way. And that's why I'm always upset about the curriculum of local schools. They don't have local history anymore. And I think it's imperative that every child should know the history of, you know, Louisville, Kentucky, right. uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, whatever. Uh, and that's why I've complained to our mayors over the years that's why I think our kids, we raise them up, send them to school, little school, middle school, high school. They go off to college and they just don't come back. Yeah. Because they don't, they don't know why, why should they come back? They were raised here, but they don't know anything about the history of Fort Worth. The first train that came in, uh, none of that. So. No. And, and, you know, and music history is, is definitely one of those things that, you, that, that, that is so important. And yet so, so little is known by the younger folks, you know, but, uh, I, I, for one, am a musical expeditionary. I guess I always have been. When somebody catches my attention, I want to learn as much as I can about not only them, but who influenced them, because it's so it's always such a cool deal to be able to trace, you know, back. And, and you can go as far back as you want. You know, it's kind of like when my brother got involved with the Western Swing thing. Before I knew it, he was listening to, you know, all the root music that came together to form that, including... Uh, much to my chagrin, polka music and, <laughs> and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, that's what it's all about, you know, and, and, uh, and so music, uh, maybe more than just anything else, you know, there's so such a rich history. And I think it's so important for, for, for folks to, to understand that without certain people, the music that they might like today wouldn't exist, you know, and uh, right. sad that most kids, uh, you know, under the age of 30, probably can't even name all four Beatles, you know. You know, and uh, take Elvis Presley. He crossed the tracks in Tupelo, and gospel music was his thing to start with, from what I know. And uh, then it evolved from there, but just something, you know, that's a kid listening to these African-American church singers and music as a youngster, and he becomes... The king. He really was the king. Well, and you look at Bob Wills. Um, you know, he grew up out, out in uh, Panhandle, uh, Cossie, Texas, Turkey, Texas, and he worked in the country Turkey. alongside the African Americans and and picked up on all the the uh, the rhythms and the and the uh, the blues and all that. And he brought that element with him to Fort Worth and met up with Milton Brown, who was doing the more of the swing big band stuff, which by the way, was influenced ultimately by uh, the, the, the African-Americans like, you know, Louis Armstrong. And yes. Keith. so, uh, you know, there's so much homage that needs, that must be paid to, to those early pioneers. And, and, uh, uh, and it's so important, you know, I, I, I don't know the, the, the blanket statement on history period is if you, those that forget the past are doomed to repeat it, you know, <laughs> so that's there's exactly right. Kind of a warning there, but you know, in, in another sense, you know, you, how can, you know, you can't really know where you're going until you know where, where, where you've, where you've been, you know, and, uh, I don't know, I've always been a history buff on, on numerous fronts, but music is definitely one of those things where right. you can, you can really take a nice, a, a fun trip down, uh, uh, that trail and, and uh, go as far back as you want. Well, sure. it's fasc fascinating to me because I was having a conversation with a guy at this convention yesterday and we were talking about the whole labor issue and we got to talking about how uh, kids just don't participate in things anymore. You know, now you've got not just kids sitting at home playing video games, but uh, kids watching other people through YouTube and Twitch and things watching other people play video games and uh, this guy that i was talking with told me that he has a nephew who pays a subscription service fee to watch other people play video games not he's sitting home playing video games but he's paying to watch other people play video games so this is kind of the uh mentality of this next generation of kids so uh, when you're talking about trying to get them interested in history of anything music or 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 civic culture or whatever it's uh I, it seems like it's incumbent upon the, the, the parents and grandparents to uh, at least plant those seeds a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. 
definitely. Right, for sure. You were talking about that. So like, uh, so paying to watch a kid play a video game. I mean, that's like right. different layers of, of uh, fan, you know, that, that's, that's really getting kind of out of touch with reality. Uh, right. That's my equivalent of sing singing karaoke song to a Milli Vanilli song. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's uh, you know, it's the whole meta universe. It's, it, it's an interesting thing. First of all, I'm disappointed. I didn't think of that hustle because somebody's getting <laughs> rich off of that, but uh, yet it shows us where we are as a society here. And you're right. It, it is getting more and more detached from reality and uh you know people have no sense of uh from where they came here and that's look, a look, that's a problem Brent, look at that that game and i don't know if it's as popular now but i mean for a while it was wildly popular that guitar hero game right and pe kids would spend hours and hours and hours learning how to play those video game guitars and master that thing and i'm thinking my god if they spent half the time learning real music they right. would be further ahead because that nets them absolutely zero on picking up a real guitar right right yeah it's all about entertainment and, and and i'll tell you the reason the whole reason i got i mean i've always loved music but the but what got me going as a musician and a songwriter was one day you know jill kind of shook me out of my my fog and said steve as much time as you spend on that ipad you know doing those painting games or whatever you're doing on that. She goes, why don't you, you're such a musically inclined person. Why don't you learn how to play an instrument like a guitar? And I said, you know what? You're right. And so she got me for my birthday. That was six years ago. And I, I just started learning how to play guitar. And all of a sudden I started writing music and, you know, and look, look what's going on now. I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, the, 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 thing is a scary thing all right well I think i'll tell you guys uh, i'll tell y'all a neat story my uh wife loves julio and glacius so every time he came to bass hall i'd always get in the orchestra pit and uh uh but anyway he came out one time and uh uh i, I don't think it was on his live show he talked about him and willie doing the duets but no it was backstage i i got us backstage and I asked him how he got involved in it. Uh, he was in a real bad car wreck when he was pretty young and has a prosthetic foot. His dad fathered a child at age 90, and he was a doctor. He swam in the ocean every day. And so Julio told us that he was laid up in the hospital for a number of months. And he, you know, he's a, he's a womanizer. And one of these nurses came in one morning and said, here, here's a guitar, play with this and leave us alone. Yep. And he said, that's how it got started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of famous people that have come out of Fort Worth, Larry. Um, uh, you know, uh, you, can, you speak like Arlington Heights High School. Not only did you have Milton Brown coming out of there in the early days, in the, the, the 20, late, late 20s, I guess it was. 25. He graduated, and you've got that that annual that has his picture in there. I know uh, it he took him five years to get out of the eleventh grade. There was only eleven <laughs> grades until nineteen forty four. Then they added the twelfth grade. Was that because he was working on farm or something? Or oh yeah, because it was depression, and uh, kids had to they'd start school, and then when things got tough, they'd have to help the the parents have enough money to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Only the real wealthy kids went on to college, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And a, and a, uh, but uh, you got Milton Brown, Ar Arlington Heights. You know, uh, so you had Milton Brown. Of course, later John Denver uh, uh, came from Arlington Heights. Uh, uh, gosh, uh, yeah, Bill Paxton was the biggest donor to my museum ever. And he graduated Arlington Heights. Yeah, and then Betty Buckley, who was the Betty Buckley. Broadway star, uh, uh, gosh, you know, and of course you can name other, you know, outside of the music business, like Bob Schieffer, the, the yeah. international news guy. And, uh, I think, I think Lee Harvey Oswald darkened the halls of Arlington Heights for a short time. I don't know for sure. Yeah, he did. And he went to Lily B. Clayton in elementary. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's the flip side of that deal. But, uh, uh, but yeah, so many, so many famous people. And of course, I'm sure other schools can can say the same thing. The ones that have been around, you know, a long time. But uh, again, Fort Worth's got such a rich 
history, music and otherwise. Um, where did that where did that Hinkley go? The one that shot Reagan? I don't know that he was Fort Worth. I thought he was down. Oh no, he was Fort Worth. He was Fort Worth. Oh, Either was. Arlington Heights or Pascal. Wow, I didn't realize that. And but, he's out now. He's no longer in prison. They finally cut him loose. He's in a he's not even in a mental institute. No, I think he's he's out with his family. Wow. Well, well, let's hope he behaves. Uh, yeah. Larry, shifting gears, in your museum, one of the things that caught my attention, because you can't miss it, in, in uh, one of the rooms there, you've got a, a, a car. That was my dad's car. They killed him in it. 1962 Impala 409. They only made 142 of them. Super they, sport. So can you elaborate on they killed him in it? What is that? Well, I mean, we don't know. I think daddy had a contract on one of our local hoodlums that I'm not going to mention the name. Uh, and he didn't, he shot him, but it just paralyzed the guy. The guy died in 1963 and, uh, of a stroke, but he was in a wheel, wheelchair, but it was his people. I researched it. It took me 18 months just to get the car back from the County. They didn't want to give it up, but finally I've got it. Yeah, it's in, it's in the museum. All I replaced was the uh, windshield and the interior because there was blood all over everywhere. He was in the car. So they they shot down him. And was he on the road or? Uh... He was out where DFW Airport is now. No, I mean, I, I don't think he was driving. I think he was, just, I don't know what he was doing. Yeah. They so... didn't, you know, that was kind of the boondocks back then. And so they didn't, they didn't find him immediately. It took a week or two before they actually found him. Oh, okay. Wow. What a story. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my deal, it's, it's been fun and my family was involved in a lot of it. And, uh, we learned, just like you say, we learned from our history and people say, God, you're not embarrassed about your dad. And I'm not, I loved him. I'm proud of him. Uh, that's just what he did. Lon Evans, the sheriff here, when I was growing up, Lon kind of took me under his wing and he said, Hey, Butch, that's just what your dad did. Yeah. You know, he said, that's just the way it was. So I've always took it at face value and just moved on. That Jacksboro Highway corridor, you know, 199, I mean, that thing at one time was just chock full of one nightclub after another, dance, dance hall after another, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. The, uh, I was, at age 10, uh, I was working the door at the Rocket Club, the one you're showing right there, when I was 10 years old. So the the gangsters would take their kids, and we'd stay outside. And so the bar manager or whatever would throw the old cardboard uh, cartons out there that the beer was in. And back then, that was way before no Don't Mess With Texas, there was big old bar ditches, and us kids... They'd give us 25 cents if we'd take the beer cartons and put them in the bar ditches and light them on fire. And so I I started thinking, hey, if I wear a pair of slacks, I can stand up there at that door and tell them it's a dollar, dollar cover charge because it wasn't a cover charge. And maybe somebody will pay me. And they did. Mm -hmm. And one guy said, there's no cover charge here. And he said, you know who that kid's dad is? And he said, oh, yeah, here, here's the dollar, kid. Get out of here. <laughs> so... Yeah, that I mean, there was uh, the Skyliner Club, which Daddy was part of. Ike and Tina Turner played there. Candy Bar was a stripper there. Uh, there was all up and down a three and a half mile stretch. There was twenty seven clubs, uh, half dozen eating joints, Avalon Motel, and another one, and no churches. Now, uh, no churches. Yeah. Uh, uh... Now, the the Casino Beach, was there really a casino there at one time? Well, the Casino Beach was, uh, it wasn't a casino. It didn't, they they had card games, but it wasn't a, like a, a full-blown casino. We had casinos here. Uh, Boston Smith had one out there off Interstate 20 where it's up on the hill. Then Top of the Hill Casino was in Arlington where Benny, Benny, Benny Binion ended up owning it. Uh, that's who my dad worked for. Uh, and Fred Browning started it, but there was a lot of gambling that went on here. And the, the gambling on the strip, on the strip, I call it, 
Thunder Road, whatever you want to call it, 199, was controlled by Carlos Marcelos out of New Orleans and Benny Binion. They split the gambling here. Wow. So it was, a, it was a, you know, there was, a, there was a guy named Elmer Sharp, big guy, and he, he actually lived to be 60-something. He's buried at Blue Bonnet Hills out in Richland Hills. Uh, he actually had a pet bear, and uh, the cops never jacked with him, but he was just a huge guy. His club was called the Private Club, and it was just an extension of his house, and uh, he wouldn't even open until the four deuces and the skyliner and all of them had closed at two or three or whatever time they decided to close. And then he would open. And the story goes that you, you'd come in, you had to put a 20 on the bar and you couldn't ask for any change, but you could drink all night. But back in those days, and I think it's still on the uh, books, people say, well, how did they have all of those places? Well, in 1936 and 1935, really, the state was getting ready for their 100-year centennial, and Ma Ferguson was the governor, and she had promised Eamon the 100-year party, which Eamon said, I don't understand that. Fort Worth wasn't here in 1836, and neither was Dallas. But Dallas ended up getting it because Eamon pissed off Ma Ferguson. So Eamon got on the phone, and President Roosevelt was his big buddy, and he said, I want enough money to start. I need to build a convention. I mean, a Coliseum, which is Will Rogers, and a open air uh, hall, which was Casa Manana. And he paid Billy Rose $1,000 a day for 35 days to oversee the building. And so then. Billy, Texas, Rose, was the top, Billy Rose was the top Broadway producer at that time. Yes. And at the time, Texas was just coming back out of prohibition. And the state would not allow alcohol, I mean, liquor. They would allow 3-2 beer. Well, I mean, go in front of the city, or he didn't go in front of anybody. He called him up and said, hey, this ain't going to work. I got all these big shots coming from all over the country. We got to have booze, women, and gambling. And so they said, Eamon, you find a confined area, and we'll make a, they had an amendment to the uh, law. It said, if you've got a residence, and you have people over that are shooting dice and drinking and gambling, it's okay. And so every one of those places had to have a bed or a cot somewhere in that building. The four deuces had four apartments. Uh, but that's how they skirted the law is they all had, I mean, there was Inez's 50-50 club was there, the Chateau Club that was wide open gambling, roulette tables, the whole deal. So uh, that's how they got away with it. And, and you know, uh, Thunder Road is what the, you know, Frank Sinatra was there. The rat, uh, the uh, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin, they all came here. And uh, Top of the Hill Casino in those days was the nicest casino in the United States. And a mile away from it was Arlington Downs. That was W.T. Wagner's deal. And they had horse racing. Just wide open, you know. There was uh, uh, the movie that Frank Sinatra made, uh, and I don't. I, maybe some of the other Rat Pack members were in it. I think it was made in the fifties. Called I think it was Robin in the Seven Hoods or something like yeah. that. And there's scenes in there where they had a, a casino, but when they they got tipped off that the law was coming, they could push a button and all the gambling tables would fold into the walls. And by the time the police got up there, it's like a gentleman's library, like smoking club or something. Well, that was Top of the Hill Casino. That's so, yeah, it, it finally got shut down. They had all these gates and all this security. It's the highest point in Tarrant County. And uh, the Texas Ranger, Lone Wolf Gonzalez, actually finally penetrated it and they shut it down. But uh, I've got pictures of Clark, uh, uh, Howard, Howard Hughes lived out there for two or three months. They wow. used to Jack Dempsey. The last few fights Jack Dempsey fought, he lived here in Fort Worth. Eamon Carter, they signed the contracts in Eamon's office. Eamon, uh, Jack Dempsey trained out there. There's a lot of boxers trained out there. And then, like I say, a mile away was Arlington Downs, and that was the big horse racing. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde spent some time here in Fort Worth, didn't they? Yeah. They, the story goes that Bonnie and Clyde 
Bonnie, I mean, Clyde and uh, Henry Medford and Pretty Boy Floyd robbed Top of the Hill Casino on New Year's Eve of 33 and got $500,000. And so Fred Browning called Benny and said, Benny, uh, and I'm when I say Benny, Benny Benyon, the ended up being the Horseshoe Casino in Vegas. He said, Benny, those cutthroats, Bonnie and Clyde, or the, bar the Barrel Gang robbed us 500000 He said, you want me to call the sheriff? And he was probably talking about Bill Decker in Dallas or the sheriff here. Uh, and Benny said, no, don't call anybody. And Benny put the word on the street, and he said, you tell Bonnie and Clyde, they'll wish the only people looking for them was the Texas Rangers and the local cops. If I don't have the money at the Southland Hotel parking garage Sunday morning, Benny lived at the Southland Hotel in Dallas. And the way the story goes, and my dad even told me this, Clyde didn't remember exactly how much they had robbed. And so they robbed a bank or robbed somebody, card game or something, to make sure they had enough money to bring back. <laughs> what a Benny Benyon, Benny was the most ruthless gangster ever lived. He had seven shooters. My dad was one of them. And Benny killed as many as the shooters did, probably. Carlos Marcello was was no uh, Boy Scout either. A lot of people. Oh no! A lot of people, uh, depending on which conspiracy you want to lean towards, a lot of people uh, attribute uh, Kennedy's assassination largely to Marcello. Well, he was in it. It's it's ironic. The day of the shooting, they pronounced Kennedy dead at one o'clock. An hour earlier, same day in New Orleans, a federal court gave Carlos Marcellos, he didn't get deported. He didn't get deported. It was a de deportation hearing. Yeah. And oh yeah. And he, cause Bobby Kennedy was all over Marcello. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and this is Fort Worth musical moments, but it's so tempting to get into all that other stuff. And of course, you know, around in and around all of the things that were going on, the, the underworld stuff, the, uh, and the above table stuff, there was always great music coming out of Fort Worth, um, you know, and, and, and every genre. Uh, I know a lot of, I'm sure very, very, you know, the biggest country stars of, of our time probably came through and played those places along Jacksboro Highway in those days. And, uh, you know, I, I remember my dad told me when he'd come in out of the oil field, that's where they would go and they could see people like Farron Young and those guys, you know, playing there. So, you know, there was a, uh... I was looking at a, a 1950-something uh, little get acquainted with Fort Worth. Fats Domino played out on Lancaster for two weeks at one of the clubs out there, the party line. Yeah. Fats Domino was pretty, you know, he was pretty big name musician back in the day. Well, and then you, I think you said, mentioned that Elvis came through. Elvis played Panther Hall and played... Uh, he played Northside Coliseum, 1956. Northside Coliseum, Elvis, and the, the, probably the two biggest stars of their day, Elvis, and then much earlier, Enrico Caruso, the great opera singer. Oh yeah, yeah, he played he played Northside Coliseum also. Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, so that's the that's the the uh, location of the world's first indoor rodeo, right? So yes, it doesn't matter what Kansas City claims; it's us. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, Grand Ole Opry claims to be the original um, uh, barn dance type show, but it, it originated at WBAP right here in Fort Worth. No, That's exactly right. Fort Worth's a, a place of a lot of firsts. Brent, do we have any questions? Any of our viewers have any questions coming in? Or uh, you know, I haven't seen any questions yet. Just a lot of people uh, in awe of some of the stories that Larry has been, been telling here today. Well, I, you know, the, uh, when, I, when Larry asked me to come out and talk to him about doing this musical moment show, about I, I went out there and I, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to just go grab uh, a, a 30 minutes or so with Larry and I'll be, and, and I think I got home at five, that was at noon. I think I got home at five, five o'clock. <laughs> we, we, and, and he and I, of course, knew a lot of the same people, but, but yeah, the stories that Larry can tell are, are incredible. And, uh, you know, gosh, you know, every, every, every one, is worthy of its own book or a movie, maybe even a movie. I mean, my gosh. The, and that's what, I think that's what separates Fort Worth. I don't know. Dallas just doesn't seem to have that. You know, we've always had this rivalry, friendly rivalry with them, <laughs> but Fort Worth just has so much more of a rich history and a traceable history and soul, you know, 
and 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 it's, you know, but it's, it's and so we've always been proud of that and tried to. And I think that's the great thing about Fort Worth is it's we're mindful as a city to preserve that. Yes, guys, I got to go. I got some people standing here. All right, great Larry. show. I'll talk to y'all next time. Larry, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Larry. Helping us. Thank you. Helping us tee up some of these other guests and uh, we'll be looking in on you from time to time. And, uh, um, uh, you know, so all the best to you. Thank you for all you do for Fort Worth and for to preserve our history and, and keep that museum going. Thumbs up. See you later. All right. Thank, thank you, Larry. Well, I tell you, you were talking about, uh, it, you know, kind of that friendly rivalry. One of the uh, uh, shining lights of Dallas is the Longhorn Ballroom. And uh, your brother Mike had a chance to venture over there yesterday for some big doings. He did. And he uh, he called me as he was on his way over there and said he, he was going to see uh, Sleep at the Wheel. And 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 I, I said, well, thanks for calling me. But I, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think he thought I was still in Tennessee. You know, he and I... Uh, kind of kept, we're like two ships that pass at high speeds of the night you know uh he's got a lot going on of course i do too with the music stuff as well but the cool thing is he and i are both in in the music space uh in different ways and yes he went over there one of the grand opening festivities i think of that historic place and i think he was invited by the actual one of the actual owners all right, and there he is with one of them right there. A big night is Ray Benson and Asleep at the Wheel was there last night, and he got a chance to tour and, and see a lot of the amazing musical memorabilia uh, that, that, that's there that really spans the generations of country music and, and Western swing. There's some swag from uh, Ray Benson and uh, uh, also uh, uh, stuff there from uh, Bob Wills as well, just uh, and, uh, you know, Waylon. Uh, so, so much great musical history there. Yeah, just about everybody who's anybody in the music business graced the doors of that place, either on stage or as a spectator. Uh, uh, Kurt Ryle was telling me about the night that, uh, and I don't remember who was playing. Maybe it was Waylon or one of those guys, but in walked Mick Jagger, uh. and uh, and uh, he uh, he he came in early that night, or no, he came in late that night is what it was after. I think he'd done a concert the Rolling Stones did, and he showed up. And, uh, his, uh, uh, I think, uh, the, the, uh, Dewey Groom's son, I think walked Mick Jack back to the office and, and Dewey Groom or one of the managers back there who had no clue who Mick Jagger was and didn't care. He goes, uh, what's he doing back here? I we don't want to, you know, th this is private back here. And he goes, well, this is Mick. I don't care who he is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it was that kind of thing. But yeah, uh, that place has a rich history. Well, it's, uh, it, it, you know, th those guys had a, a deep appreciation for it. I know it shows up in, in Mike's documentary, the uh, birth and history of Western swing is they uh, had their rendition of Bob Wills is still the King, the, uh, the great Wayland song. Yeah. That Mick, 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 uh, Mick and the stones did. And Ron Wood, uh, uh, made an attempt to do a, a, a Western swing steel guitar, you know, and so you can't fault him for trying, uh, you know, it's, uh, but well, he's uh, no Tommy white, but it wasn't terrible. No, no, no. And the fact that he was able to sit down and do it at all is commendable, you know? And, and, and the main thing is they were tipping their hat to right. influences. Cause I know country music is a bit you know, is a big influence on the Rolling Stones and some of their songs reflect that. Like, uh, it's all over now, you know, has kind of a country feel to it, you know, and, and on and on and on that, that far away eyes song that they did. Right. And, yeah that one album, I can't remember it came out in the eighties, but you know, so yeah, they're, 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 they're always quick to acknowledge and, and to pay homage to uh, the, their influences for sure. And I think Mick and, and uh, the Rolling Stones got to be pretty big Whalen fans and, and vice versa. All right. All right. Well, I tell you, we talk about history. You guys were making some history this week in Clarksville, Tennessee, working on some new songs, 11 new songs cut in, uh, in about the blink of an eye this week. Man, I'll tell you what, that was something else, you know. So, yeah, I, I came up here, I came up to Clarksville a couple of months ago and sat down with Kurt and we, I said, you know, it's time to, to write some new music and look at, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I was, I've been very happy with the, the results of, of the release of my first album, through Clarksville Creative Sound with Kurt as my producer. Um, it's gotten great reception, won some awards, a song, uh, one of the songs 
Oklahoma's calling me one song of the year through the CMA of Texas. And I was very honored for that. And uh, I've just gotten, you know, a, a great response, uh, done very well in terms of selling CDs and downloads and things like that. And uh, and we took it out and uh, uh, live and performed the music. And one of the greatest tests of, of, of that music was taking new Western swing that nobody's ever heard and seeing what would happen with the dance floor without playing one Bob Will song or one Milton Brown song or, or, or and, 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 and it was amazing. Uh, and what was really amazing is when the, 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 the uh, patrons, when Kurt uh, halfway through that concert said, folks, all this music you've been listening to is stuff you've never heard before. And yet the dance floor was packed. So that just tells you if it's good music and, and then we stay true to the roots of Western swing, but as we did try to further evolve it with bringing in new elements that, uh, that this music has a, stronger appeal than ever and that's what we're we're proving i think day in and day out us and, and other artists are so yeah so how do you follow up with that 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 uh, uh this is swing country album you know uh, we sat down and 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 really worked hard on writing some new material and and so th this came back in the studio kurt pulled in the greatest studio musicians you can i mean uh, brent you were there and you met those guys right. Blew me away the caliber of, of musicianship that was in there. Absolutely, world class. I mean, you had Tommy White on steel and uh, Wanda Vick on on fiddle, and both of those will be standing on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry tonight, uh, uh, playing as part of the uh, Opry House Band. So, I mean, that's the caliber of uh, uh, of musician you had there. And you're right. After listening to the, those instrumentals cut on Monday, uh, this definitely takes and builds on what you guys did with this is swing country here, and takes it to another oh. level. We had Dane Bryant on. Yes. I had not met Dane because typically we had a Jimmy Nichols play on my last album, but Kurt, uh, Jim, Jimmy was not available and Kurt brought Dane in. And when I understood what Dane's pedigree was, I was like, holy smoke. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, here's he's Dolly Parton's producer and just got through producing a, a duets album with uh, kind of a rock and roll thing with the who's who of, of uh, popular music. Elton John, Billy Joel, uh, you know, on and on and on. I mean, it's just amazing. And so, yeah, I was I was pinching myself. Right. Absolutely. Well, I want to share a clip of one of the uh, vocals that was cut here this week and give you just a taste, uh, just a tease, just enough to get you ready for this next album coming out here. This is rough. Just remember this, there's power in each kiss, and love can turn the darkness into light. Uh, just beautiful stuff there. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled at how this music's turning out. You know, uh, when Kurt and I sat and wrote these songs, and Kurt's amazing because as we were writing these songs and getting them the lyrics finished he'd pick up his guitar and just start strumming the melody you know he's, he's just so talented that way and so we we sat down and and just did recordings with kurt playing the acoustic guitar but you to watch them to, to hear them and watch them come to life with all that great musicianship is just a whole nother deal and uh and so i, I it was such a uh a great thing to be able to to then come back and do vocals over all that 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 instrumental the, the great instrumental uh that that we had with all these musicians and we're not done yet i mean kurt was bringing in some some horns to uh, on certain things and we'll be you know uh refining those vocals and you know and uh, uh have some some harmonies in certain areas but when it's done it'll be i think another landmark album uh uh we've got uh i think 10 original songs and two or two or three covers. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, I'm excited about it. They all sound phenomenal. And you saw Kurt's 
uh, uh, image there in the doorway is reflection there. And uh, that reminds me, we want to make sure that we plug Road Stories with Kurt Ryle this Monday at 7 p.m. Central. That's going to be on the Kurt Ryle Road Stories Facebook page and a few other outlets. So make sure you're watching that. Uh, he's got no shortage of stories from his time on the roads with some of the great in uh, country music history. Speaking of on the road and speaking of uh, being out there playing, you know, Kurt has been in this business a long time and you, we had talked about uh, the uh, Longhorn ballroom earlier. You know, Kurt was the leader house of that house band from 79 to 86. And so he was there and he, he worked with just about everybody in country music and popular music. I mean, heck he said, he remembered the night, the, he remembered the night that I think the sex pistols came through there <laughs> didn't back them up. Uh, they they did their own deal, but you know that. But he was there uh, making history, and uh, I'm proud to say that two members of my A list band, Kurt Ryle and Shane McCauley, the drummer, uh, are both uh, were both a part of that band, along with our good friend Junior Knight. Uh, and uh, so uh, so we're we are working on actually making an appearance out there, hopefully, uh, and I think it'll be great homecoming for Kurt and and Shane for sure. Well, stay tuned for that because I'm sure if it happens here and when it happens, you'll you'll know about it here on this Fort Worth Musical Moments Facebook group. So get plugged into that if you're not already. Also, the Clarksville Creative Sound Facebook group, the Real Strong Media Facebook page. And uh, stay with us here because we're building a lot of content that, that's going to go on these platforms. And we'll be back here again next Friday at 10 a.m. Central with another Fort Worth Musical Moments. And uh, we, we've got uh, quite a few big guests that are going to be coming in the next few weeks to to entertain you. So I hope you come back for that. And if you missed any of this, we're going to archive it immediately. So uh, make sure you go back and, and watch it in its entirety and and, and dig into some of those Larry O'Neill stories because, uh, boy, he's got some good ones, doesn't he? He does. He does. I mean, you, yeah, you could you could go. We, he could fill a year's worth of shows and, and just scratch the surface. But uh, uh interesting interesting gentleman he is and make sure you go follow his fort worth memories he's on <laughs> he's on all the time on uh on facebook doing live stream so uh, uh you never know what you'll find out from larry he is a font of information so go check that out and i wanted to invite you all to check out rural strong radio which is our 24 7 streaming radio station found at ruralstrongmedia.com or on the live 365 streaming radio app and it plays the best in traditional country music, Western swing and bluegrass, a little Southern rock and inspirational. We got everything on there uh, from Asleep at the Wheel to Steve Marquardt. Uh, so make sure you go check that out. We'd love for you to uh, be a part of that. Again, ruralstrongmedia.com or the Live 365 streaming radio app. And uh, we always like to plug a couple of programs that we've got there on the channel on Sundays, beginning at 9 a.m. Central uh, is... Uh, Robbie Lynn's Sunday's kind of country where he plays uh, three hours of great inspirational country music from legendary artists and uh, great independent artists. And we try to uh, uh, put a short set on there about uh, 1145 ish uh, central time uh, where we do about 15 minutes of, uh, of different artists there that, that takes us up to uh, the top of the hour, noon central one Eastern where we bring in Billy Bowles for Billy, Billy Bowles swinging country. I know Billy's on here today. So, Hey to Billy. A uh, great uh, uh, program playing traditional country and Western swing music. One of the great proponents of uh, that music. So make sure you go check those out again. Sunday's kind of country with Robbie Lynn at 9 a.m. Central and Billy Bowles swinging country at noon Central. And we'd love for you to, to come and, and, and join us each day here. It's portable. Get that Live 365 app and listen. We're going to be bringing a lot of the Clarksville Creative Sound artists onto there. And we've got a lot of great ag programming. We're getting ready to announce some uh, uh, programming in the trucking industry. So uh, if you're plugged into to great traditional country and Western swing and, and just rural lifestyle, uh, that's the place to be. So right. uh, Billy Bowles and our good friend, Billy Bowles. And I always appreciate Billy taking time to tune in because I know he's he's working feverishly to get his show ready every week. Uh, and, and his show, um, I have to say his show is so well thought out, you know, right. that's, Things just don't happen automatically. I mean, Billy puts so much thought and has a theme for every show and and carefully places the music pieces in there that fit in with that theme. Very entertaining. So I, I urge everybody to catch it, um, uh, you know, as you rebroadcast it. He comes out originally out of KSSL uh, out in the uh, 
uh, Lubbock area, Slayton, Sundown. Uh, and, and I had a long talk with our good friend, Kathy Jewell yesterday, who owns that station. And what a, what a jewel she is. I mean, nice. just a beautiful lady and quite a great artist in her own right. And she's uh, uh, coming on board as a, a Clarksville creative sound artist as well. So I want to just give a shout out to Kathy. Excellent. Yes. Uh, Kathy and Suzanne Abbey, everybody there at KSSL, uh, great folks. So, uh, you can catch the first stream of that KSSLFM.com 10 AM central on Saturdays. And I know there's a Facebook group that's very active with that, uh, kind of listening along and a lot of the artists that uh, you hear on, on that show, uh, get on there so you can kind of connect with some of them too. So, uh, make sure you go check out the Billy Bowl Swing Country group on Facebook as well. Well, I tell you what, I got a trucking show to get to. I'm going to bring my friend here. We got uh, we got some trucking to get done here. We're going to be uh, eastbound down here to the uh, Kentucky Exposition Center in a few minutes. So be watching the uh, uh, Real Strong Media Facebook page today. We're going to be doing some check-ins with some folks from the trucking industry and and just having some fun. We'll be back here again next Friday, 10 a.m. Central for Fort Worth Musical Moments. And Steve, hope you have a great weekend and uh, get a chance to catch up on some rest here. Thanks, Brent. Put the hammer down, as they say in the trucking business, and, but watch out for Smokey. <laughs> All right, 10-4, good buddy. Well, I tell you what, until next time, it's uh, Brent Adams here with uh, uh, Steve Markward. We'll be back again next week. So keep riding tall in the saddle. Make it a great week, everybody. You've been watching Fort Worth Musical Moments, a production of Rural Strong Media and Clarksville Creative Sound, copyright 2023. Please join the Fort Worth Musical Moments Facebook group and join us each Friday at 10 a.m. Central as we introduce you to another key figure in Fort Worth's musical heritage.